Good evening everyone. Welcome to Verity Baptist Church Manila's Wednesday night service. And for our first song, let us grab our hymnals and turn to song number 260. Song number 260. Please say amen when you're there. Song number 260. He is able to deliver thee. Song number 260. He is able to deliver thee. This the grandest theme through the ages strong on the first ready 
Sing. Tis the grandest theme for the ages long. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world can song. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though my sin. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme in the earth or me. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal strain. Tis the grandest theme till the world again. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. My sin of rest goes to him for us. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest thing. Let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Good to God in vain, he will make thee all. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is saved. Our sin of rest goes to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the good crowd. And also, uh, we thank you for all the souls that we received a while ago. Lord, we uh, ask you to bless the sermon tonight. Give us the understanding and give our preacher the boldness in preaching your word. Forgive us on our sins. In this name we pray. Amen. For our next song. Let's turn to song number 129. Song number 129. Song number 129. Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages. Left for me on the first. Ready? Sing. Rock of Ages. Left for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from the wound inside which flowed be a sin the double cure. See from wrath and make me whole. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no longer? Sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. In my hand, no bribes I cling. Simply to thy cross I cling. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes are closing, death. When I rise to worlds unknown. Bible in the book of Joel, Joel chapter 1, Joel chapter number 1, uh, we will read the whole chapter beginning from verse number 1, Joel chapter number 1 the Bible reads, the word of the Lord that came to Joel the son of Bethuel, all this ye old men, and give ear, all inhabitants of the land, are has been your days, or even the days of your fathers, shall ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and and their children and other generation that twist the palm worm hath left hath the locus eaten, and that twist the locus hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that twist the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, O ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid me 
my fine ways and bark my victory cat married clean bill and cast it away the branches drop are made white lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth the meat offering the drink offering is cattle from the house of the lord the priests there are ministers born born the blood is wasted the land mourned for the corn is wasted the new wine is dried up the old language yet be ashamed o you husband men how o you bind wrestlers for the wheat and for the barley because of the harvest of the spirits the vine is dried up and the fig tree languish yet the pomegranate tree the palm tree, palm tree also and the apple tree even all the trees of the field are withered because two is withered away from the sons of men your jewel serves and lament you priests how you ministers of the altar come lie all night in sackcloth you ministers of my god for amid offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of your god sanctify your fast call a solemn assembly gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the lord your god and cry unto the lord alas for the day for the day of the lord is at hand and as a destruction for the almighty shall it come it's not the meat cattle before your before our eyes we are joined with others from the house of our god the city is rotten under their clouds the gardens are laid desolate the bars are broken down for the corn is withered how the beasts grown the herds of the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture yet a flock of sheep are made desolate o lord to thee will i cry for a fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness and a flame hath burned all the trees of the field the beasts of the field cry also unto thee for the rivers of waters are dried up and a fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness alas pray amram salangat salamat po panginoon sa araw na ito na pinagkalaob dahil po namin panginoon na napatambayan po ngayon yung aming service Apos po sa inyo po si Ibadog Christ sa kanyang preaching ngayong araw at tulungan po kami na maunawaan po ang inyong salita po aming dalangin sa kanap ng Sus. Amen. Alright, we're in, we're there in Joel chapter number 1 and I want to thank uh, Brother Stocky and Pastor Jimenez for giving me the opportunity to preach this uh, evening to you and it's a great crowd tonight and I appreciate you coming out and Uh, tonight we're actually starting a uh, Bible study in the book of Joel and some of you might not be fully <laughs> aware that that part of the book was it's actually in the minor prophets and I understand because you know it, especially in the Philippines you know there is you know if there is there's going to be a very few people or few preachers that would open in the book of Joel let alone you know uh, start a Bible study in it and you know the reason why I'm actually starting this you know this Bible study is because of the fact that I want to show you that, you know, when you read your Bible, even though it's like in the back end of your Old Testament scriptures, you know, you ha- you're going to learn a lot of, you know, uh, truths and great teachings in these books. And I understand, you know, when the church was, you know, starting, Brother Stocky kind of preached through all of those minor prophets. He, he, he kind of preached on, you know, Malachi and Hosea and things like that. And so I really pick a book that, you know, after Hosea would be, you know Joel and and that is actually on the minor prophets and we're going and and that's going to be the bible study that we're going to be having whenever uh, I'm, I will be assigned as the preacher and a lot of you would be probably ask you know who is Joel right or Joel or Joel or who, however you pronounce that name okay i want you to look at Joel chapter number one. look at verse number six. because uh, you know the, in verse number one, we only uh, you know the bible reads the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel, okay? And, you know, you didn't, you, you don't get a lot of information out of that verse of who actually prophet Joel was because of the fact that, you know, he's just, you, you just get that his name, that he, the prophet was called Joel, and he's the son of Bethuel, but you, did, you don't know actually where, you know, Joel was, Joel came from, and who actually Bethuel is, right? Because unlike if you would go to, uh, Go if you would to to Isaiah chapter number one, and let's just get let's just have a comparison of this comparing to other you know prophets or major or minor prophets that are in in the Bible. Okay, so look at Isaiah chapter number one. Look at verse number one. You sh- usually read this you know in starting on a on a on a prophet on a major prophet book or in a my, my, my minor prophet book where they give you an idea of where or and when you know. Uh, that prophet is actually preaching. An example of this in Isaiah is in Isaiah chapter number one, in verse number one, where the Bible reads, "The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, 
in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So out of that verse, you see that Isaiah was actually preaching in the time of the kings Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And he told you that those kings were from Judah, right? Go if you would to Hosea chapter number 1. Hosea chapter number 1. And let me give you another example of this. In Hosea chapter 1, that's actually the first book of the minor pro of the section of the Bible which is called the Minor Prophets. And in Hosea chapter number 1, in verse number 1, it says, The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Berei, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So you see that Hosea, compared to Isaiah, who's actually just preaching in the kingdom of Judah, you know, Hosea has a ministry in the land of Israel, in the kingdom of, you know, in the kingdom of Israel, because he's also, he's also preaching in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. So there are books in the, of the prophets where you can actually point that, hey, this is where this prophet preached, and this is the timeline, and, you know, and all these things. But there are certain books that you can find in the Bible, like, you know, the book that we're going to talk about this evening, Joel, where, just, where it's just like the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Now, who's Joel, right? And who's Pethuel? Now, I believe we can get the, the context of the text because the, the, the thing that I want you to understand is that though this, you know, preaching or though this book seems to have a deeper understand or a deeper meaning, right? When we, when we read these books and we think like, well, I can't really understand this because we cannot really understand the context. We have to understand that these people actually preach to real, you know, to a real situation, right? In a real scenario, in a real nation. And so we have to understand what the context of where they are or where and why they are preaching the message that they are preaching. Now go with you to Joel chapter number one and let's get some clues on where and when Joel was actually preaching. Okay, because again in verse number one you really can't get any information aside from the fact that the prophet's name is Joel and his father's name was Pethuel. Okay, look at verse number six. Okay. Joel chapter number one and verse number six. The Bible reads, For a nation is come up upon my land, for a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he had the cheek teeth of a great lion. So in the in the book of Joel, what you see is he's actually prophesying and he's actually talking about a nation, okay, that is come upon his land. And he's a, it's a strong and without and a nation that is without number. And I believe that's a clue to where and when Joel was preaching because he says that that that, that nation can be you know that described as a uh, as somebody as as as, as a uh, a nation whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. Okay? And he had a cheek teeth of a great lion. Now, I don't really and I'm not dogmatic about this, and this is just my opinion. I believe that Joel was actually preaching at the time where the king of the kingdom of Judah is actually going to be conquered by the kingdom of Babylon. Because if you think about that verse in Joel chapter one verse six, it's talking about a lion, okay? And if you would go to Daniel chapter number seven, because you know when I was thinking about what could that lion you know mean, okay? I don't. I think it's not an accident that the Bible describes Babylon as a lion okay an example of this is in daniel chapter 7 look at verse number one this is a prophecy of uh, prophet daniel in the first year verse number one in the first year of belshazzar king of babylon daniel had a dream and vision of his head upon his bed then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters verse 2 daniel spake and said i saw in my vision by night and behold the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea and the four beasts came up from the sea diverse one from another the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld his wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and stand upon the feet of a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And this is a prophecy of the kingdom of Babylon. Okay? And so what I believe is in, if, in, if you think about Joel chapter 1, verse number 6, he's talking about a nation whose teeth is a teeth of a lion. It, it, it goes back to, you know, the prophecy or that, that nation talks about you know, 
Daniel. Go if, uh, about Babylon. Go if you to first to Second Kings chapter twenty. Second Kings chapter number twenty. So when was that? Okay. Now I've been, and that's not only the 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 pronouncement or the prophecy that the that the kingdom of Judah will actually be conquered by the Babylonians because you can also see that in some of the historical books, so to speak, in the Bible. Because you have here in 2 Kings chapter 20 a story of Isaiah, of Hezekiah rather, okay, being rebuked by the prophet Isaiah when he showed the kingdom of Judah to the Babylonians. Okay, look at verse number 14. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said this man? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, Are, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah said, And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then, Hezekiah, uh, then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which hath thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? So Isaiah is actually rebuking Hezekiah that, you know what, since you showed, you know, all the treasures of the kingdom of Judah to this heathen nation, Babylon, you know, I'm going to cause this nation to actually conquer your land, okay? And your sons is going to be slaves in this nation. And the fulfillment of that is actually four chapters later. Go if you to Second Kings chapter 24. And this is what I believe that it's actually happening on the days of Joel. 2 Kings chapter 24, look at verse number 1. And his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees, and bands of the Syrians, and bands of the Moabites, and bands of the Ammon, of the children of Ammon, and sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by his servants the prophet, Surely as the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did and also for the innocent blood that he shed for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood which the Lord would not pardon. So I believe that this is the instance on which we can point out to the history that this is where you know prophet Joel might be you know starting his ministry okay and i and as i have said i'm not really dogmatic about that this is just what i see from my own study of the scripture if you have an idea and you think that that's different for me it's up to you but the point that i want to make is that even if you know for example of the of, of a prophet in the perspective of a prophet that you know he's not really famous in a sense that we don't know where or when he started his ministry you know what regardless of that the bible commands us in the new testament to preach the word okay so it's not that you know it's uh, the minor prophets is a lesser you know book of the bible it's also an important message because every word of god is pure the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctor. So whether it's in the minor prophets or it's in the mi or in the major prophet, we ought to take heed. And you know the Bible says as preachers we should preach the word of God, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all our suffering and doctrine. Okay, go if you would back to Joel chapter number one. Joel chapter number one. And I believe, okay, and the second thing that I want to point out before we go on with the uh, with, uh, verse by verse uh, study of Joel is that if you're going to look at the book of Joel, okay, the overarching theme or the most common topic that you're going to be, uh, that you're going to find in the book of Joel, okay, when you read it, is the topic about the day of the Lord, okay? And the reason why I, I said that is because if you do like a simple word search on your Bible app or something like that, okay, the book, the, the, the word or the, the, the phrase, the day of the Lord, actually is, uh, pops up five times in the book of Joel. And if you're going to compare that, okay, 
with 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 the whole Bible, actually, what you're gonna find is that the only book that has more mentions of the day of the Lord is in I believe in Zechariah, where it's actually mentioned six times. But if you're going to compare, you know, Joel and the book of Zechariah, Joel has only three chapters in it, while Zechariah has twelve chapters in it. Okay, so I believe that you know it's gonna be you know the book where it's actually fine and that's just uh, where you're where you're gonna be where you're gonna find a lot of you know doctrine about the day of the lord and let's just look at those topics obviously we're gonna be coming uh we're gonna come across them as we study the book but let me just give you those reference the first mention was in joel chapter 1 in verse number 15 it says alas for the day for the day of the lord is at hand and as the destruction from almighty shall it come the second mention is in Joel chapter 2 in verse number 1, where it says, Behold, blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. All, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. The third mention is in verse 11, Joel chapter 2 verse 11. The third mention was in verse 31, and the last mention, okay, is in Joel chapter 3, Verse number 15. Go if you would to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. We're just going to give, this is just like an introduction to the book of Joel. Just to give you some, you know, things to think about and things like a trivial things that you can, you can, you know, wherein you can remember the book of Joel. But obviously, we know that the day of the Lord is, you know, being described in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Look at verse number 1. But the times of the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when sh they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So what the Bible is teaching actually about the day of the Lord is that this day is not actually gonna cut us as thief in the night. But what you have to understand is that statement is you know given to a Christian. Okay? It's given to a saved, you know, born again child of God that he's saying that the day of the Lord will not cut you as a thief in the night because you know that there are, there are certain things that are gonna happen before that day of the Lord will come. But what you have to understand too is that to the unbeliever, right, to the people that doesn't believe in Christ, this day will be coming as a thief in the night. And it's described as, you know, they're saying, even, even in, in verse number 3, it's saying that, you know, these people will say, you know, peace and safety. So these people will actually, you know, neglect the fact that, you know, there's going to there's gonna come a day where there's going to be sudden destruction and they're just going to say, oh, it's not a big deal. Okay, but then it says, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon woman with child. And what you're gonna see in the book of Joel, especially tonight, that you know the Joel is actually warning them of this destruction that's gonna take place in Judah. Okay, but it seems to them that you know it's not gonna matter to them. Okay, they're gonna you know they're gonna, they're not they're gonna ignore what the prophet Joel is actually teaching them. But, and that's also the reality that we're going to see when we reach that day where we, even if we warn our, you know, even if we warn our, you know, love, our unsaved loved ones of this destruction, the Bible says that even they see the, you know, all the destruction that, you know, God poured, when God poured out His wrath, they did, they did not repent of their idolatries, right? That they did not repent and they did not believe on the Lord to be saved, Right? Now let's go down. Let's dig now. Let's dig deep now on the book of Joel. Go back if you would to Joel chapter number one. And I have five, four points uh, about the uh, about in the chapter Joel chapter number one. And the title actually of the sermon is the callings of the Lord. Okay, the callings of the Lord. And I want you to know, notice that in the book, prophet Joel, the the first chapter of the prophet of the book of Joel, Joel actually. Gave, uh, gave us four callings from God. Okay, and what is a calling? It's not, and what I mean when I say calling is that you're, God is not calling you to be a preacher or something like that. Okay, that's not what I mean. Okay, what I mean is there's a message that God wants that the people to understand 
but they are actually ignoring this message. Okay? Look at Joel chapter number 1. Look at verse number 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old man, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Had this been in your days or even in the days of your father? So what he's actually asking us is point number one, there is a call to remembrance. There is a call to remembrance. Because he's saying to these old people, okay, and not just to the old people, but all of the inhabitants of the... Yo, think about this. Is this happening? Is this thing happening in the past? I mean, is this thing been normal, right? To you that are already old people, do you really think that this is something normal that is actually happening in our society? Okay, he's saying, all ye inhabitants has had this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers. So what he's saying is that is this thing already happened to you? Okay, do you really think that this is, you know, something that is normal? I mean, if you think about today in our society, if you're going to make an application of this, you can think about, you know, the, the society that we're, gonna li we're living in, where we can even ask old people, like, hey, do you really think, had, had, didn't, had this been in your days where, you know, a lot of people from the school system are turning to be atheists? Right? Is it this been in your days where, you know, a lot of, you know, people that are men dressed like women? I mean, if you look at the history of the Philippines, they would say yes, right? Because if you think of, if you look at the history of the Philippines, there are a lot of people, even in the time of, you know, the Spaniards, and I don't know if the time of the Catholic, uh, of the Americans here in the, well, during the invasion of the Americans, that there are a lot of cross-dressers, right? They, they glory, actually, you know what? Let me tell you something. You know, Philippines have already has always glorified cross dressing in the Philippines. You know, think about Dolphy. I mean, think about all these comedians that you know, whenever they have their movies, right? That they have that they're cross dressing, cross dressing. And what do the people do? Do they really discuss and say, "Hey, that's you know, that's an abomination to the Lord"? Re the reality is the fact that you know they actually laugh at it. They are actually entertained by what they're doing. And so, you know, if Joe is going to be asked, hey, had this been in your days? Actually, the Filipino would just say yes. Right? Okay? They would ignore what Joe is saying, that, you know what, God is going to punish you for your sins. Okay? But, you know, the Philippines would just oh, that's that's normal. You know? That, that's even the, and I think that's even the reason why we are so, you know, we're so loose in our mentality about, you know, the sodomites. That we think that, you know, we should allow these people to go out and to, you know, molest, other, to molest our eyes, so to speak, when we see them, okay? Because to them, it's normal. It's, you know, the, and, and whose fault is that? You know, what, part of the reason is that, you know, a lot of people allowed, you know, their kids and their children and their family to be brainwashed by the television. That's one. Okay, but here's the thing, you know, what did the churches do? Did they preach hard against that? Did they condemn all these stupid comedians that, you know, earn millions of pesos just by cross-dressing? No, they didn't. You know why? Because they wanted to. I mean, you know, you, you, you look at the stand, a, a regular Baptist preacher, you know what you see? You see that their kids are a lot, the, the ideology, ideologies of their kids are more of that of the world than of that of the church. And you think like, what have they done? Are they not discipling their own kids? Right? So we see that actually, Joel was actually asking them, hey, had this been in your days? Right? Verse 3, if it is, then you know, tell, and this is what you have to do if it is. Verse 3, Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. So what he's saying is that, you know what, if this had been in your days, you know what, you need to tell your children. Because if it has not been in your days, you know what, you need to go back to the old way. Seek that path, that old path, not that, you know, that in the end where, you know, you're going to lead to hell, okay? That's not what I mean, okay? What I mean is you seek the old path where is the good way, the Bible says. Right? Wherein you can find good old preach. That's why it's important as a church that, you know, even if our tradi tradition in, you know, in man's eye is so old-fashioned, so to speak, that we teach this tradition to our children. Right? 
it, it's never gonna be get it's not gonna get old to sing old-fashioned hymns okay I know we call them old-fashioned but you know what that's just hymns for me that's just hymns spiritual songs that we're gonna sing and they are they, to me it's not gonna get old-fashioned you know why because we're gonna sing it until I'm the father of my house we're gonna sing it because that's what we need to do as parents Amen. to tell our kids that hey this is the right way and the way that you see in the television the way that you see in the world is a wrong way even though they say it's cool right that even though they say oh oh you're so old-fashioned and you're so badui right that's what they say in the philippines right you're so badui and you're so you know you need to wear this new clothing no women still need to dress dress okay and men should still wear pants okay unfortunately in the philippines that's not the rule anymore because you know what in schools when men are allowed to wear skirts like what in the world i mean you know women are allowed to wear pants which is to us filipinos are normal right but in reality and now they take it to another level where men okay men can allow you know and i i because this blows my mind men can men are allowed to wear pants not but not makeup okay no makeup you can wear you, you can wear skirts what i mean you can you can have your hair as long as you want okay just to take care of your mental health but you know no makeup like, what in the world okay so what's the result of this okay what's the result of what is what is joel want to say to these people okay look at verse 4 joel verse 4 joel chapter 1 verse 4 he's saying that which the power palmer worm had left had the locust eaten and that which the locust had left had the canker worm eaten and that which the canker worm had left had the caterpillar eaten so he's saying that you have to tell this to your children if this had been in your days that you know what there is a famine that is getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse okay that's the direct context of what joel was actually preaching okay in the first four four verses of his book now what's the application of this okay well he's saying that you know you have to realize has then has this been in the old days where there's actually a famine after a famine where there's a famine of the palmer worm where the palm the palmer worm actually you know infest the crops then after that there's going to be a locust and there's going to be a canker worm and that which the canker worm had left had the caterpillar eaten now just for the sake of you know the brother peace do you have you seen a power palmer worm in your life no okay what is a canker worm brother chris i don't know but it's a worm okay let's just all agree it's a worm okay it's whether it's a palmer worm or a canker worm okay i don't care but it's a worm okay and what you have to understand it's group of uh, it's group with locust and caterpillar now cutter locust definitely would be among that which is com which is uh symb symbolic of a famine go if you would to deuteronomy chapter 28 deuteronomy chapter 28 And in Deuteronomy chapter number 28, what you see is God actually warning them and giving them an option to actually whether they're going to be obey, they're, they're going to obey or they're going to disobey, you know, the will of the law of the Lord, right? And in the first 14 chap 14 verses of Deuteronomy chapter 8, what you see are blessings if they obey God. But actually, if you look at that and i don't have the last number of that of that chapter but i believe it's a long chapter uh there's only 14 verses that talks about the blessing and the rest actually talks about and it's actually 68 chap 68 verses 14 verses only talks about the blessings and the rest is actually talking about the curses of god okay and what you see is that god is actually warning them to be uh of the curses that they're gonna that they're gonna uh you know they're gonna in, that they're that's gonna happen to them okay if they disobey the law of the lord and i want you to understand that if joel was asking hey remember this remember your past had this been in the days of your fathers you know 
I suggest to you that if they're just going to stop and think of, you know, ha is this really happened in the past? They would remember Deuteronomy chapter 28. Okay? Look at verse number 15. Shall, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Curse shalt thou be in the city and curse shalt thou be in the field. Curse shalt be thy basket and thy store. Curse shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land and in the increase of thy cattle and the flocks of thy sheep. Curse shalt thou be when thou comest in and curse shalt thou be when thou goest out. For the sake of time, go down if you would to verse 35. Deuteronomy chapter 28, look at verse number 35. And the Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore bulge that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot from the top of and unto the top of thy head. The Lord shall bring thee and the king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation whether thou nor thy fathers have known, where neither thou nor, nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt thou and there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. And thou shalt become an uh, astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whether the Lord shall lead thee. Thou shalt carry much seed out of the field, and shalt gather but little in, for the locusts shall consume it. So what the Bible is telling us in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and what the, it's actually God telling the children of Israel, is that if you serve other gods, if you disobey my commandment, there's going to be a curse that when you plant all the seeds in your field, you're just going to gather little in. Why? Because the locusts shall consume it. And the point that I want to make is if these people already see the locusts that is infesting their land, they should remember, hey, we're at sin. But they don't do that. Why? Because they think it's normal. They have, they, they need some Joel just to, I mean, they need Joel just to tell them, hey, remember this. And so what we see in the book of Joel is a call to remembrance. Go, if, go if you would, back to Joel chapter number 2. Or Joel chapter number 1. Put your finger in Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're going to go back there. But go, if you would, to Joel chapter number 1. And obviously, you know, what you, what you also see the, here is that, you know, that is actually even in the, in the end times, right? That the first thing that's going to come up is the pestilence and you know, the famines in the land, okay? An example of that would be in Matthew chapter number uh, 24. You don't have to go there. But it says in Matthew 24, verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is because of the fact that, as I have said, a lot of the book of Joel is talking about, you know, end times Bible prophecy, all right? But go if you to Joel chapter 1. Look at verse number 5. Joel chapter number 1, verse number 5. So point number 1, there's a call to remembrance. Had this been in your days and in the days of your father, right? Point number 2 is a call to realize. Look at Joel chapter number 1, look at verse number 5. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and how all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. What he's saying is that you have to awake, ye drunkards, okay? And you know, you might think that drunkards is, actually drunkards there is a negative connotation, meaning that they, the, the people that are drinking this is drinking actually an alcoholic wine. Okay, and the reason why I believe that is because of the fact he's telling them to be awake, right? Because if you're drunk, what you are, what you are not is you're not, you're not sober, right? You're not actually awake. So what it's saying is that, you know, you need to awake you, drunkards and weep and howl all ye drinkers of wine because of the new wine for it is cut off from your mouth. Actually, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And I don't have the time to go out to go there, but obviously we all know that, you know, wine, drinking alcoholic beverage is actually condemned by the Bible. Okay. Verse 6, For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he had the cheek teeth of a great lion. He had laid my vine ways and barked my fig tree. He had made it clean bare and cast it away, and the branches, the branches thereof are made white. So what you see in Joel chapter number, uh, in verse number 5 and to verse number 
7 is the fact that he's telling you to realize that these things are happening because of the fact that you actually sin. So the first point is that you you actually there's a call for you to to remember and to remember you have to you know realize that you are actually sinning because it's not it this it didn't just stop by sending a famine in the land right it actually it actually followed it was actually followed up by you know a conquering of nation by babylon actually conquering the land okay because it says that for a nation is come up upon my land strong and without number okay and the reason why they're they're having this you know uh, bad things happening in their land is because of the fact that they don't uh, uh, they don't obey the word of God. Go if you uh, you keep your finger in Deuteronomy chapter number twenty eight. Look at verse number four, forty nine if, if you would. Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight. Why are Please look at verse 14. And let me read for you verse 45. Moreover, all the curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed, thou, because thou hast hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandment and his statutes, which he commanded thee. For, verse 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue shall thou not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, we shall not regard the person of the old, nor shew favor to the young, and he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of, the, of thy land, until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thy, thee thy either coin, corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thine kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates, until thy high and fence walk, walls come down, wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And thou shalt eat of the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, and the siege and the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee and again what i want to point to you out is that you know god through the prophet joel is actually asking the people hey number one remember had this been in the old days and once you remember this you have to you know realize be awake realize if you're if if you're doing this that you don't have any more excuse me you don't have any more new wine for those people that wants to drink okay because there's already a nation that is conquering your land okay go back if you would to Jeter joel chapter one joel chapter one first point we see a call to remember second is we see a call to realize but joel chapter one verse eight calls for a revival okay and i want you to notice this Look at verse number 8. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut up from the house of the Lord. The priest, the Lord's ministers mourn. So I want you to understand that, you know what, did, you know, the prophet Joel, you know, ask, you know, the leaders of the children of Judah, the kings, right? The kings of, the kings and the princess of the, the kingdom of Judah to mourn. No, he's actually telling that there is the the mourning should come from the house of the Lord. And the the point that I want to make, and the application that I want to make in this passage is the fact that you know what there should be since we there should be a revival that is going on in the house of the Lord. Because the problem is not going to be solved in the government. A lot of people think that, you know, if we just support the government and if we elect a lot of, you know, godly uh, of leaders and that has good platforms, n no, don't, don't mind if they're, you know, religious or something like that. You know, look for a government official that is intelligent and has a plan and blah, 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 that this country will be better. Now, first off, that's not going to happen, okay? Okay, but I, would, but I would say that if you're going to choose a leader, the Bible says that you you actually look for the qualification of his godliness if he's not covetous 
rather than you know if these people are actually able to do the job right why because if god you know is is with them he's going to enable them to do the task right but and here in Joel chapter 1 we see that it's not just the government and the whole land is, is languishing in fact he's saying to the people to to the priests that you have to lament like a virgin why because the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the lord the priest the lord's minister mourn verse 10 the field is wasted the land mourneth for the corn is wasted the new wine is dried up the la the oil languisheth be ashamed o ye husbandmen how o ye vine dressers for the wheat and for the barley because the harvest of the field is perished so there is a connection between the house of the lord right because he's saying the offering the meat offering the drink offering is cut up for the, from the house of the lord okay and the field is wasted and the more and the land mourned the corn wasted and all these things and it's actually saying that the husbandman should be ashamed and the vine dressers look at verse number 13. Oh, sorry verse number 12 rather sorry and the vine is dried up and the fig tree languisheth and the pomegranate tree and the palm tree also and the apple tree even all the trees of the field are withered why because joy is withered away from the sons of men so what you see is that actually the reason why there is a you know the the field is wasted the land mourned the jo the corn is wasted is and all this you know plants are not actually producing fruit it's not because of the famine okay the bible tells us in the last part of verse 12 that it's because joy is withered from the sons of men okay and i want you to understand that this is talking uh, and if you're going to apply this in the new testament okay this is telling us that there should be you know a revival in the house of the uh, in the house of god which is in our case in the new testament is the church of the living god the new testament church okay and if you compare about that what is on husband look at verse 11 be ashamed oh ye be ashamed oh ye husbandmen and how ye vine dressers okay who is he talking to that who to which people are we talking about that here in the new testament now think about who are the husband men of god who it is us because it is us which were given the ministry of the rec of reconciliation and even paul says in first corinthians chapter 9 you don't have to turn there but it says for though i preach the gospel i have nothing to glory of for woe is unto me if i preach not the gospel so what he's saying is that you know as a husband man of god you know we're going to be ashamed he says he's saying woe unto me woe is unto me if i preach not the gospel of the lord jesus christ so he's saying that you know as husband men, if we don't preach the gospel you know we are going to be ashamed and the reason why i think about that go if you would, john chapter 15 john chapter number 15 It's because Jesus also told us that as Jesus is the vine, okay, and the Father is, her, is the husbandman, okay, look at verse number one. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch that in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken you. Abide in me, and I abide and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except ye abide in the vein no more can ye can ye except ye abide in me I am the vine ye are the branches he that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me you can do nothing and this is what I want you to I want you to understand look at verse jump down if you would to verse number eight because isn't it that if you're ashamed you're not glorifying the 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 person the person that you're serving right and in this case the the husband man is our father 
and we are 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 the husbandmen, meaning we're under the under the husbandman, the 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 the, the father. And in verse 8, this is a secret on how we can glorify the Father. Look at verse number 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So how are we going to glorify God in 2023, according to the Bible? Well, according to the Bible, we can glorify God. We will glorify God if we, as a church, you know, bear much fruit. And how are we going to bear much fruit? Well, the Bible says we should go soul winning, okay? And what I believe is that, you know, in, in Joel chapter 1, in verse number, it, it, the reason why the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off is because of the fact that the church is not getting joy anymore because it's not actually fulfilling its duty of evangelizing the world. And we see that today in 2023, where there's a lot of Baptist churches, not just in the United States, not just in, a, in, 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 in the West or in, the, in Europe or in America or something like that, you know, but even here in the Philippines, we see a lot of Baptist churches that doesn't go soul winning, right? And you know, tomorrow is gonna be a soul winning marathon, so this is just gonna be a pep talk that you need to go soul winning tomorrow, right? Okay, because you know, there, because as a church, we should enjoy to go soul winning, right? In fact, the Bible says, if you look at Joel chapter 1, it says the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of, God, of the Lord. Think about Romans chapter 12, when the Bible says that you should, you know, you should, be, you should, you know, you should present your bodies a living sacrifice, Right? You don't have to turn there, but Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Okay? And again, you might say that I don't have a talent, I don't have a talent in preaching or song leading or playing instruments or blah, blah, blah. But you know what your reasonable service is as a church member? So winning. And you know what? I'm, I'm tired of hearing people, you know, and not, not in this church, okay, but there are a lot of people that would say, oh, soul winning is not my gift. Where do you see in the Bible that soul winning is a gift, friend? You can't see a Bible verse that's saying soul winning is a gift. Okay? Because it's not. It's a responsibility when say, God said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And whether you do it or not, you know, it's a word ask. I mean, what do you think your boss will tell you, will feel when you say, hey, brother Sean, do this. And say, oh, I, I'm, not, I'm not able to do that. That's not my gift. You know, the mere fact your boss is saying to do this, you know, you do everything in your, you know, in your, in your mind, in your, you, you know, to, to do that, to accomplish it, because it's your boss that is telling you to do it. I mean, what if, you know, one time, you're, the president of the company shows up in your desk and he says, you know, can you do this for me? You know, would you say, it's not my job. Really? If the president of your company shows up in your desk and say, can you, can you run this errand for me? I mean, I remember that one time that, you know, I was a student assistant in my, in my school. And then the president of the, of the school called called me and he said can you do this errand? and even if it, it's not my task you know i was i was forced to do it you know why because that's the boss of the company okay and today a lot of christians would say you know would already read matthew 28 mark 16 to say to go the, and preach the gospel to every creature but they say oh it's not my talent it's not i don't have time really okay i mean how hard is it to, for you to give up 15 minutes, one hour of your time of, of the week, not even the, of the day, friend, because you have 24 hours a day, you have seven days a week. What about you give up one hour of that just to go, just for you to preach the gospel to the lost? How about that, right? But no, a lot of people are so busy, you know, a lot of these churches are so lame, they're not going so winning, and the reason, and, the, and the, you know, there's a famine, so to speak. Okay, the vine, the, you know, the, the oil is languished, so to speak, right? Meaning that the Holy Ghost is not anymore with them. And what happens is, you know, a lot of people would ask for, oh, let's get revival. 
They would pray for revival, but you know what? The revival won't come if you don't get out there to preach the gospel to the lost friend. I mean, that's the first step. You see in the Bible, every time, a, per, every time a, bi a Bible character is depressed, and I showed this last time, right? That every time a Bible character is depressed in, you know, in the Bible, God always gives him something to do, like Elijah, Elijah right? He was, he was depressed, and I want to die, Lord. Oh, okay, so go ordain, you know, the king of Syria and Jeroboam and, you know, and, this pe and Jehu and, you know, Elijah to be the next in line with the leadership. Do something, right? Why? Because, number one, there's a call for remembrance. There's a call for, there's a call to realize and a call for revival. Go back, if you would, to Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter number one. Fourth point. Fourth point is a call for repentance. A call for repentance. And I'm not saying repent of your sins to be saved, okay? <laughs> Don't get me started on that, okay? <laughs> Okay, a call of repentance because number one, okay, these people are already saved. They are already in the house of Israel, okay? They're the children of, of Israel. They're the children of Judah. So, you know, more or less, we should say that, you know, these people are saved. So, just like, you know, when you see a Baptist church that is doing the, the works that God has given them, you cannot say that 100% of that church is actually saved. You know, we can hope that every, you know, every people in this church is actually the same but the, you know there are sometimes you know there are people that would be mixed up that there would be always infiltrators so you cannot really say that 100 percent of the niche of this church is actually the same now i'm not saying that the whole children of judah and the whole country of Ju judah is actually safe but you know this is the location where you can see at that time that they're gonna be more you know people that are safe right because this is the hub of christianity so to speak in the old testament but even though you know you see these people that are saved okay god is still c calling them to repentance look at joel chapter 1 look at verse 13 gird yourself and lament ye priest how ye ministers of the altar come lie all night in sackcloth ye ministers of my god for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your god sanctify ye a fast call a, se ho a solemn assembly Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord, Alas for the day, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come, is not the meat cut up from before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed is rotten under their clods, and the gardeners are laid desolate. The bars are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan and the herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture? Yea, the flocks of sheep, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, for thee, I, to thee I will, will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field, and the beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. So we see that Joel is actually telling hey you know gird yourself lament you priest do this all, all do all these things sanctify a fast call a solemn assembly okay why because there's gonna be more that's coming because the day of the Lord is at hand and it's a destruction from the Alma and, and as a destruction from the Almighty it shall come and even in you know the first and so what do you, so what should we do? Look at verse nine and the verse verse nineteen says actually, O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field, and the beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of water are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. So it's saying that you know what you have to do these things, but you have to trust in the Lord. You have to ask the lord to forgive you because you sinned and that's the only and that's the only way that we as christians can get you know things you know that can 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 do especially in the society that we live in today right that we can ask that the only thing that we can do is to ask forgiveness for the sins that we're doing okay and because here's the thing 
Okay, the problem, we always think about, you know, the problem is, you know, outside the church. Okay, outside, you know, if, if only we have a godly president, or if we only have, like, you know, this, if only Manny Pacquiao won as the president of, no, okay? <laughs> it, even if Manny Pacquiao won as the president of the Philippines, the, 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 the problems of the Philippines will not get away, okay? Because it's not the, it's not the, it's, it's not the unsaved people that is the problem, okay? The problem is the saved people. I mean, think about how many people we got saved and where are they? You know, a lot of, you know, a lot of pastors that are critics of this church would say, Oh, you see, you see, uh, you, you have a lot of salvation, but where are they? You know, they're in their houses, okay? They're in their televisions, still watching television, still watching, you know, Vice Pangit or something like that in, tele in television. But they're saved, okay? Because you cannot, say, you cannot be saved by your works. Your salvation is based on your faith. So whether you, whether you watch television or whether you, you know, do, you still drink or something like that, okay, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, you're saved, right? Okay, because you're, you're not saved by works, you're saved by faith, okay? So we get people saved, but the problem is that a lot of them don't repent of their sins, right? And, you know, if, if you think about that, as long as, as, as long as we're getting saved, or we're getting people saved, right? Okay, we can spare this country. But imagine if those people that are saved start going to church. Imagine if those people would start looking for a great church. Or how about this? You know, what, what about if those people that are zealous, that are saved, start going to right churches? You know, right? Because a lot of people, you know, they are saved. Okay, but they still, you know, chose to 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 stay on their unsaved church, where or I mean the church where the pastor is unsaved. Okay, how about if those people would just start coming to the right church? Okay, how about if we see a great revival of a lot of churches, not just Verity Baptist, but a lot of churches doing soul winning over and over again, and we knock the city, you know, multiple times. Imagine what will be the effect of that. Okay, but you know what? That starts with a repentant heart. That starts if we admit that it's not the outside that's the problem, it's the churches. It's the people that are preaching the gospel, that, that, that has the, the, the ministry of reconciliation that doesn't do the work. Last, please go if you would to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. We see a call to remember. Had this been in our days? Think about this. Had this been in our days where this sin abounds? Where, you know, people that are freaks are, and dogs are, call, are, are normalized and you as a Bible-believing Christian are being ostracized, right? Remember, okay, there's a call to remember, right? There's a call to remember. There's a call to realize. If this is already happening, what should we do as Christians? And a call to revival and a call to rep repentance. Last place, Second Chronicles chapter seventeen, chapter seven, verse fourteen. The Bible reads, "If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways." And by the way, that's not you know the or your ordinary you know unsaved people outside the church. Those people are, notice, if my people, which are called by my name, which are God's children, which are Christians, okay, shall humble them, themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The problem is not, you know, the people that are unsafe. The problem is the same. What, what, as what, we as saved people are doing with our lives let us bow our heads and pray dear heavenly father lord thank you for this evening thank you lord for uh allowing us to be in your house tonight we pray lord that you would uh help us lord to uh apply the sermon in our lives lord help us lord that we uh to take heed lord of uh of your message of remembering the past lord of taking heed of uh of realizing our faults and 
asking for revival and, re for, uh, and repent of our sins, Lord God. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to live holy lives as we go along our ways. We also pray that you would help us, Lord, to win more souls tomorrow. Be with us, Lord, as, as we start our soul winning marathon uh, for the couple of days, Lord, as, as we celebrate uh, the, all, the, all the holidays that we have here in the Philippines. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. For our last song, let us turn to song number 134. Song number 134. Song number 134. My anchor holds. Though the angry surges roll. On the first, ready, sing. Though the angry Surges roll on my tempest driven soul. I am peaceful for I know while we do. Thank you for the preaching that we heard. May we apply this in our lives. Also, Lord, we're uh, asking for their guidance as we go on our separate ways. Lord, uh, we ask for your blessing uh, towards our uh, 
soul winning marathon for the upcoming days. Lord, we thank you for all the blessing and uh, forgive us on our sins.